Well, praise the Lord. In the great, in the Lord's presence this morning, there is fullness of joy. The Scripture says, and we are so privileged to experience that. Uh, isn't it nice to have the old rugged cross behind us here? Just a symbol of, you know, what God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. This morning we're talking about the second coming of Christ, and really it's a part one of probably a three-part sermon series. And as I've rolled this out, really what we're looking at is we're not just looking at the second coming. We are forming the context, really, as the scripture lays out eternity past to eternity present, or to eternity future, okay? Now, I want to, you know, I've been a Christian for a long time, and when I first came to the Lord, there was a lot of teaching and communication about the second coming of Christ. There was a lot, like it was a major theme, and it was very good. And I feel what's happened, though, over the years is many times I feel that people in churches have moved away from speaking about it because it became very dogmatic in how it was being presented. There, there, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 tells us, and, and if you want to make some notes this morning, some of the verses will be up on the screen. Some of them I will simply make reference to. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 tells us that knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. So a lot of times we have knowledge and we almost use it as a weapon. Um, and, and that's not God's intention. Paul actually, nothing wrong with knowledge. We are encouraged to get knowledge. But Paul says, uh, Holy Spirit speaking through him, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if we are not speaking what we're saying in love and in gentleness, we are misrepresenting the truth. So we do not want to become dogmatic or divisive about our opinions as it relates to some of the things that I will share with you regarding uh, eschatology, which is the study of end times, and about the second coming of Christ, and even some of the other aspects that we're going to be talking about as an overarching picture from Scripture regarding eternity past to eternity future. But it is important that we dive into the Word of God and understand the urgency of the time that we live in. There is so much in Scripture that talks about uh, from our time until the end of this age. And I want to take the time over these upcoming three weeks, including this week, to discuss these with you. You know, there was a lot of, even though the Scriptures in the Old Testament, when you study them, are so clear about when the Messiah, Jesus, would come, the first time. It talks about how he would suffer. It talks about how he would die. It talks about he, how he would be born in Bethlehem. It talks about how he would be born of a virgin. All of these things are predicted in the Old Testament. In fact, as I've shared with you before, if you were to hold up your Bible, one-third of that Bible, Old and New Testament, one-third of those scriptures actually are predicting future events that were not, had not taken place at the time of their writing. Of that one-third of prophecy, predicting future events, two-thirds of that has been fulfilled. Approximately two-thirds of that has been fulfilled to the detail. When you study the life of Christ and you align that with Old Testament, many years ago, I had the opportunity to lead a gentleman and his family to the Lord. And both of his parents, he was a Jewish man, both of his parents had been in the Holocaust. He was from out east in Toronto. He had moved out west. We actually ended up renting them a place. That's how we ended up bumping into them. And got talking to them about Jesus. And I was able to use the Old Testament scriptures to show him how Jesus actually fulfills these prophecies of the Messiah coming the first time. How he would die. And when I showed him the, these, and of course he was somewhat familiar because his parents had been, uh, they, they had been practicing Jews. He said his mom, when, when he was growing up, 
after his mom and dad had gotten out of the concentration camps, the war was over, he said the doorbell would ring and she'd run and hide under the bed. Years later in Toronto, <laughs> she'd run and hide under the bed because he said that's what happened. The trauma of just coming and they just took him away. As we looked at the Old Testament scriptures together, and he says to me, he says, who do they think that these scriptures are actually talking about? <laughs> like, who could it be but Jesus? The Jesus is recorded in the New Testament. Anyway, I'm getting uh, sidetracked here just a little bit. But that will happen on occasion during this series, I'm sure. But there was a certain amount of mystery surrounding, even though the, the scriptures were so clear in what would happen when the Messiah came the first time? The suffering servant, as is often described. There was a certain amount of mystery about that. Even people like John the Baptist, who had direct revelation from God, and John's entire purpose was to prepare the way for the Christ, for Jesus. And he declared... Multiple times, this is the Lamb of God pointing directly at Jesus. He continuously was pointing to Jesus saying, this is the Messiah we've been waiting for. This was his primary purpose in ministry, in life. But we see even John as he is in prison toward the end of his life. In John 7, 19, he was even having a hard time getting his head around some of the aspects and the mysteries of how Christ came. So just like there were certain mysteries around the first coming of Christ, a lot of detail, but also certain mysteries, I think God keeps it that way intentionally, so there is also certain mysteries around his second coming. There's certain things that different people that love the Lord, that study scripture will have, differences of opinion on and we want to leave room for that however i do want to teach you from the scriptures as this is a subject that i have looked at throughout the scriptures front to back uh, for many years it is important that we teach about this the book of revelation for those of you that aren't aware the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, the last book of the New Testament, the last book of the Bible, the entire book from chapters uh, uh, 4 through to the end, the entire book is predicting future events. It's actually talking about what will take place. Many of those things are actually from the time we live until the end of this age. Chapter 1 of Revelation is actually the revelation of Jesus Christ to the Apostle John. It is Jesus being revealed to John in his glorified state. Chapters 2 and 3 are seven letters to seven of the different churches of what is predominantly in Turkey right now. And the churches of that day, but those messages to those churches are completely relevant for us today from chapter 4 through to the end, are future events. We're going to be looking at some of these. And there is so many prophecies that we are simply going to be on a high level looking at some of these events. Now today, I want to cover three parts, uh, subparts in this series. Number one, I want to talk about the pre-Adam or Adamite age. So before Adam, okay? What, what, was, what existed before Adam? We're going to talk about that. Then I want to look at creation and, the, and, and the, what, what's called the Adamite age or, or at the time of creation. Okay, we're going to talk about that this morning. And as much as we have time, I want to talk about God's covenant with Abraham, which is often called the age of promise. I think it's extremely important that we are looking at these subjects. In fact, in Revelation, it tells us that blessed is he, Revelation 1.3, blessed is he who reads this book and hears and obeys what it says. So there is a blessing of God that comes upon us as we are looking at and studying these events, both of history and of future. So in Genesis chapter 1, we want to start uh, are you excited about this? I'm excited about this. I just love I love kind of reviewing these things, putting it into a way that we can share it together um, in the time that we have. 
on Sunday mornings. The first area that we're going to be looking at is prior to the six literal days of creation, so the pre-Adamite age. Prior to the six literal days of creation, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says this, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was six literal days in which God created everything as we know it, as described in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. However, of this time, uh, prior to the six days of creation, many details are left unclear. But there are some things that are clear. First of all, the earth, and again, I will be repeating this at different times. We are not going to be dogmatic about the position that we're sharing this morning, but I do think it's important that for each of us, we study the scriptures and we look at these events. God has always been a creator. Amen? He doesn't change. And he exists, and this is a little hard for us to understand. He has existed from eternity past. And he does not change. He has always been a creator. In the six literal days, and I believe, I say literal because I believe there were six 24-hour days as we have 24-hour days. I don't believe, and I'm not dogmatic about this, but I don't believe that, you know, the scripture says a day is is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. Some people teach, you know, that was all stretched out over time. No problem. When we know, when we get there, we'll know. But the reality for what I'm teaching you this morning is I have, read the you know a lot of times I have these topics in my head as I'm reading the Bible front to back you know multiple times in a year and and as I'm reading them I just see scriptures oh yeah that's where that fits in and that's where that fits it's very interesting because God wants us to look at the scriptures as a whole not just taking things in in isolation as I've done that I believe it is was six literal days of creation prior to this I actually uh, it, it, the scripture teaches us that in verse 1 of, of, of the Bible, actually, Genesis 1-1, that God created the heavens and the earth. What's interesting is, it then goes on to explain here the six days of creation. Nowhere in there is actually the earth described as being created. The earth, I believe, existed prior to the six literal days of creation. Now, I'm not going to get, again, dogmatic about this, but I actually believe that there was an existence on the earth prior to the six literal days of creation. I believe the scripture actually teaches that, and I'm going to show you from scripture why I believe that's true. Many of the details of that time are very unclear. But as I said, we know God has always been a creator, and we know that he existed from eternity past. In Genesis 1-1, it is clear that the earth was created by God And that this, as I said, did not take place in the six literal days of creation. Because when you read the account in Genesis 1 and 2, it says on each of the six days what was created. Okay. It does say in Genesis 1 verse 2 that the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. This is a prophetic Uh, It's a literal event, but it's also a prophetic passage that states when there is darkness and when there is chaos, as there was on the earth at this time, the Spirit of God, when he begins to hover, he brings light (laughs) and he brings order and he brings uh, uh, creative things. One of the things that is very apparent as you study scripture, and we're going to be looking at some of those scriptures this morning, is that actually Satan, Lucifer, the fallen angels, all of God's angels, it is quite apparent that they were created outside of the six days of creation, that they actually existed prior to the six days of creation. We're going to look at some verses that clearly state this. Now again, if I'm rattling And if you're watching online, if I'm rattling your theology here this morning, you know what? Again, I'm not going to be dogmatic about this. Uh, The reality uh, is that, you know what? Um, We believe that the scripture is very clear that we are 
born again, saved by grace because of the finished work of the cross. However, I think there is enough evidence this morning that there's, it's important that we look at this. One of the reasons why it's important that we look at this is because if there was existence on the earth prior, when you look in the King James, when actually God tells Adam and Eve, you know, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, actually in the King James it actually says replenish. It's a very interesting passage. Replenish the earth. It's very interesting. Again, we don't know what that creation prior to uh, our, our creation as we have it now, we don't know what exactly what that looked like. But some scholars tell us that the earth absolutely had creation on it. Many scholars tell us that it had creation on it and uh, previously. And that Lucifer, or Satan, as he's now called, as one of the three archangels, which if you want to take some notes, you might want to do that this morning. We're going to be looking at some verses. As one of the three archangels, along with Michael and Gabriel, had a certain authority here on this earth. Because Satan and his fallen angels rebelled against God, the earth was cursed. And it went into that state of darkness, chaos. That's what rebellion does in our lives. It brings chaos. It brings darkness. As we read in uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. One other thing that appears um, quite clear from Scripture is that Satan is actually, the time when Satan fell is spoken to in multiple Scriptures, and we're going to read this together. Ezekiel chapter 28, if you want to pull that verse up, uh, please, and we'll read this together. This is a prophetic uh, a passage. Now, it speaks of the king of Tyre. Now, the earthly king of the nation of Tyre, or the kingdom of Tyre, actually, at that time, was Thabalus II. Okay, history tells us that. Thabalus II was the actual physical king of Tyre, the one who was ruling and reigning in Tyre. The supernatural spirit king behind this kingdom was actually Lucifer himself, who is actually, in this passage we're going to look at in Ezekiel 28, who is mostly referred to as proof by the many statements that could not possibly apply to anyone other than Lucifer. Now, I just want to say this. I don't know this, but I speculate a couple of things. One, first of all, uh, I like science. I took sciences through school. My brother's actually a biologist, or I'm sorry, has a biology degree, has taught biology for years. Um, a lot of the things that scientists, because true science, science and, and, and the scriptures are completely in alignment. True science and the scriptures are completely in alignment. And scientists that are born-again believers that actually get into debates with people that are not Christians, that are scientists, absolutely decimate them in those debates. Because as I was taught in university, the theories of evolution and these kinds of things, much of it is complete falsehood. And there's no scientific evidence to prove it. There are massive gaps, and there's all kinds of trails we could go down here. There are massive gaps as they talk about a, uh, you know, uh, uh, an evolution between species. So there's, there's microevolution uh, micro within a species. But the, but the idea of a half this and a half that and, and the, the, the millions and billions of years that took place between those, uh, you know, where there was this continuum that you see progression there's just no there's no there's no evidence to support that however and even the even the identification of the uh, fossils that they have and how they date those you know some of that is very suspect i'll just you can look into it yourself but that's not really what we're focusing on this morning however i do believe that it is very possible please hear me that there is fossil evidence that could have existed from the prior creation. I want to repeat, true science 
and scripture are not in contradiction to each other. It's real quiet online. <laughs> As I've studied scripture and someone who knows a certain amount about science and has had conversations, I absolutely believe that sometimes we become very dogmatic about things that perhaps we just need to look into a little bit further. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 11 through 16. Very interesting passage, passage, and it is talking about the fall of Lucifer. Let's read it uh, together. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, which clearly could not be talking about uh, the current king of Tyre. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. I just want to stop in here for a moment. Satan has always, I actually believe, as one of the archangels, Lucifer led worship in heaven to God. It says when he was created, the, the, the ability of, of music and worship was created right within him. The gifts and the calling of God are without repentance, which means this. You can have a gift and never use that gift for God and for God's purposes in your life, and you will still have that gift because God doesn't take it back. Satan had these gifts of music, and he is using them today for his purposes. But God created music to be something that's beautiful and edifying and brings worship and glorifies him. Satan is still using those gifts. Workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day that you were created. There was a day in which Satan was created. Okay? You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you, God says. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of fiery stones. From my study of scripture, this could only be referring to Lucifer. This could only be referring to Satan. In, its, uh, in this passage. You see this same double reference. I just want to say this. In, there is a natural realm, and I understand that, you know, the, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Satan is not in charge, okay? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. A lot of times on the realm of the first heaven, Satan endeavors to perpetuate his purposes, for an example, just like he, because Judas Iscariot, the disciple of Jesus that actually betrayed Jesus, because his heart did not believe, Satan was allowed to fill his heart. That's what, that's what the scripture tells us. He actually became filled with Satan. Satan then, Satan himself, not one of his demonic spirits, Satan himself prompted Judas Iscariot, Iscariot to betray Jesus to the Jewish leaders so that he would be crucified. But you know what? God is higher than all of this. Please hear me. God is higher than all of this. God's purposes will always, hear me, God's purposes will always be fulfilled in the end. It's just as we as individuals that have a choice, are we going to cooperate with God's purposes or are we actually going to cooperate with the enemy's temporary kind of things? So although Satan wanted to kill Jesus and he inspired Judas Iscariot and others, I'm sure, to put that all together, God already prophesied that this was going to take place and that it was going to actually be turned for our good because Jesus didn't lose his life. He laid it down. Well, it's also very true that as we study these passages that there is this clear sense that there is an earthly realm and kings and governments. Behind that, there is a very real spiritual realm where the enemy is trying to perpetrate his purposes through those governments, but ultimately God's purposes are going to be fulfilled. Amen? We see this same dual kind of reference 
in Isaiah chapter 14, speaking of um, the king of Babylon. Let's read this together. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Why does he say that? I will be like the Most High. Because you know what, folks? Satan could see perfectly the glory of God. And he knew, even he knew at this point, there is nothing greater. He said, I can't, you can't be above God. He feels all in all. All of creation is held together within God. And even Satan at this point, he says, I will be like the most. He, there was nothing greater. There was no higher position. I will be like the most high. Yet, you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. When Lucifer is one of the three archangels, interesting that a third of the angels actually fell with him, led a rebellion against God in heaven. He was thrown down to earth. Jesus makes reference to this in Luke chapter 10, verses 18 through 20. Don't you love this stuff? I love this stuff because it shows the victory we have in Christ. It shows the sovereignty of God, and it shows the position. One of the things I want us as a church and those that are watching online, one of the things that I want you to be aware of is that you have a position and a mandate to fulfill on the earth, and you have authority. Luke chapter 10, verses 18 to 20. Now, this is Jesus speaking. Now, Jesus is not created. He is the second person of the Godhead. And he has existed from eternity past. He is equal with God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. He told his disciples, as they have just come back from casting out demons and healing the sick, Yes, he told them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them, and nothing will injure you. But don't rejoice that evil spirits obey you. (laughs) Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. Folks, Heaven is far more amazing than we could ever imagine. Hell is far worse. Hell was never created for people. It was created for the devil and his demonic forces. Why? The scripture says, um, well, we'll, I'll finish going through my notes here because I get to that in the next point here. Satan and his demonic forces that followed him were judged at that time, actually. Their sentence has already been handed out. There will be a great white throne judgment where all of creation will stand before the Lord and give an account. But actually, Satan and his demonic forces are already judged, and they are simply waiting for an execution of their sentence. Matthew chapter 8, verse 29 says this. Jesus is casting out demonic spirits out of someone and they began screaming at him why are you interfering with us son of god have you come here to torture us before god's appointed time there is a time that is already appointed where satan and his demonic forces will be uh their sentence will be executed they know this time is coming and they want to deceive hear me their goal is to deceive as many people as possible so that people as well, although uh, they were not created for hell, that they too will also go to this place of torment, separated from God. And they are on an all, listen, they are on an all-out mission to deceive people from hearing and understanding and responding to the gospel. And that's why, hear me, it is so important we are bold and fearless as we share Jesus with people because the truth will set you free. Man, Pastor Rob, that's good preaching. I know. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) 
queen, a queen clap. Thank you very much. John chapter, John chapter 16, verse 11 says this. Jesus, again, is speaking. Judgment will, become, will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. They are simply awaiting the execution of their sentence. You see, one of the reasons why Satan, please hear me, why he hates you and he hates me so much is because everything he fell for that we read about in those earlier passages, that I want to be like God, I want to rule and reign with God, God has, listened to me, he's offered that to you and I freely. He's offered that to you and I freely. Let's read about it in Romans chapter 8, verse 17 through 23. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. Whoa. I don't know if you've ever received an inheritance. That's a powerful thing, isn't it? Maybe you know somebody that's received an inheritance. It's a powerful thing. Especially if it's a large inheritance. Do you know what? We have a large, very large inheritance. Our father, he's extremely wealthy. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. Verse 18. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Okay, so I want to, we're, in this passage, we actually are skipping forward a little bit to future kind of topics that we're going to cover in this series. For all creation is waiting eagerly for the future for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are, against its will, all creation was subjected, subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Do you know there will be a day when death and decay no longer has a place? For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up until the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. There's so much here and there's so many scriptures that actually unpack all of this. And I encourage you to go on a journey to study these things and be aware of these things and make yourself some notes because it inspires, you know why? Because this inspires me to live for Jesus today. The second topic we kind of want to cover is actually the, the creation or recreation the time of Adam until the time of Abraham. We're going to talk just for a few minutes about this. So we talked about that the days of creation were six literal days. As described, if you want to read the account in its entirety, Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, to Genesis chapter 2, verse 14. And it is, of course, referred to throughout the rest of Scripture, but this is the initial account of creation. From the time of creation... Until the end of this age, God's intention, please hear me, God's intention has and always is that we, he would establish his kingdom on this earth through us people. That was his intention. You can read about it very, very clearly there. This was God's mandate to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Let's read it in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Then God blessed them. Do you know what? That's God's desire is to bless us. It's his desire. He wants to bless us. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. When you read this passage, you know, Satan later comes and he tells Adam and Eve, you know what? People believe this lie still today. You know, when I was playing sports, most of you know I primarily played hockey. And when I was playing... You know, sometimes you had 
one move that kind of worked often, and you'd go back to that. Satan has one thing, a few things that he goes back to over and over again because they work. We believe them. One of those things is this. God's trying to hold something back from you. That if you really give your life to God, if you really serve him wholeheartedly, if you really surrender to Jesus Christ and allow him to lead your life, you are going to live, this is the lie, you're going to live some second-class existence. You're going to miss out on all the really good things in life. Well, many of us in this room have lived long enough and served God long enough to know that's a lie. But for many people, especially people that are just new in the faith, they actually believe this. This is the same lie that Adam and Eve were told by Satan, and they fell for it. In Genesis uh, chapter 2, but God actually, as we read there, God actually created us to rule and reign with him. Satan is, and he was, trying to deceive and distract us from this purpose. In Genesis chapter 2, God placed man in the garden, man, me, mankind, when it says mankind, that's men and women, in the garden, and they were free to eat of any other fruit of the trees except the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why is that? Why is there a choice? Why did God even put this tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden to begin with? And make it so that Adam and Eve could actually choose to sin. Why did he do that? Well, I'm going to tell you why. God created man because he wanted to be in, in an intimate man and woman, mankind. He created us so that we could be in an intimate love relationship with him. That is the primary, predominant reason he created us. That relationship was to be the context by which he, we would rule under God's authority and establish his kingdom on this earth. That mandate has actually been redeemed and restored in Christ. Where there is real love, why did God allow that tree or create that tree and allow that to be in the garden? Why did Adam and Eve, why were they allowed to have a choice? Where there is real love, there has to be a real choice. There can't be a demonstration of love without a choice. You have to choose. And if God hasn't allowed you to have a choice, you can't actually demonstrate love, but he has. He's given each one of us a choice. But you know what? A choice is a very, very powerful thing. So where there is real love, there has to be a real choice. And where there's real choice, there is real power. Listen to me. A lot of people are... They can't get their head around God being so good with so much suffering in the world. I'm not going to be simplistic this morning and endeavor to answer that question tritely because I sit with many people that have suffered tremendously. But I'll say this. Where there is real love, there has to be real choice. Where there is real choice, there is real power. Power to do good and power to do harm. God will not take away our choice. I meet with people on a weekly basis that are dealing with high levels of pain in their life. And so often it is simply because someone chose. Doesn't seem fair, I understand that. But you realize God still deeply desires that intimate, close, loving relationship with you and that he really, really wants that. My question this morning to you is, and for those of you that are watching online, is do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know he created you with a purpose? Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 through 4 talks about the fall of man, Adam and Eve having a choice. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which God, the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, the first thing, listen to me, the first thing that Satan will try to do is question what God said in your head. If you hear that, recognize where it's come from. Did God say, but he twists it. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of any of the trees of the garden? Well, we just read what God said. God said, you can eat of any of the trees of the garden except of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Eve repeats it. 
Has God indeed said you shall not eat of the trees, every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees, fruit uh, of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent says to the woman, You won't surely die. God's trying to hold something good back from you. As you go on, and if you have that open in your Bible, you can read on. He says, you're going to become just like God, knowing good and evil. God's trying to hold something good back from you. Adam and Eve both fell for Satan's deception. And sin entered the world. Because of man's choice, sin arrived. It separated us from God, and at that point, they didn't die physically, but eventually they did die physically, but they died spiritually. And that's why every single person that comes and responds to Jesus Christ has the opportunity to gain back that place of right standing and right relationship with God. What, when Jesus is talking with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, Again, you can write that down if you're not familiar with it. Read it later. When he's talking with Nicodemus, he says to Nicodemus, he says, Nicodemus, this was a religious leader who probably had memorized basically the entire, what we call our Old Testament, vast majority. He would have memorized the whole thing. He says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you won't see the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus says to him, what are you t- how can a man old like me be born a second time, go into my mother's womb, be born a second time. He didn't understand. Jesus said, I'm not talking about physical birth. He said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. The Holy Spirit, when you respond to the gospel, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you. You become alive to God. Some of you in this room in the last year have given your life to Christ. And all of a sudden, you're hearing things. You're noticing changes in your life, and you're thinking, well, how how is this happening? Because your spirit is now alive to God, and although God has always loved you, you've given him your yes, and you're starting to hear his voice. And when you die physically, and you're alive to to God, your spirit is a real you, the real you is a spirit being. When when you die physically, your spirit, which is alive to God, is going to continue to live in relationship and in his presence. So no, they didn't die immediately physically, but they died and they were separated from God. Christ came so that that could be redeemed back to us. I want to look at this passage in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Not getting as far as I would like today, but you know what? I want to take the time to go through uh, these things in at least the detail. We're really just skimming the surface on this stuff. (laughs) We really are, and I'm aware of that. But I think it's important that we look at what the Scripture says about these topics as we move toward, in the upcoming um, Sundays, we move toward speaking about our current time and actually the events that are prophesied to be fulfilled between now and the end of the age, the end of this age. Now in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we see a prophetic passage, Adam and Eve They fall for Satan's deception, but even then, God already had a plan for restoration. Let me just give you this quick little interlude. For the mistakes that you and I have made, where we have really blown it, God already has a plan of redemption for you. He's already got a plan. He's just waiting for you to give you, he's just waiting for you to give him your yes. I've watched that in my own family. I've watched that in my dad, my mom. I've watched it in my brothers and their families. The brokenness, alcoholism, violence. (laughs) Chaos, just like was on the face of the earth. (laughs) Darkness. And I watched when we gave God our yes, how he turned all of that for good. You can't screw things up so bad that God can't unwind it. You just need to come to him with your full yes. Invite Christ into your life. If you're watching this online and you're feeling today like you have no hope whatsoever, God all along has always intended that you would not only have a choice, but you would have a path to see his redemption and his blessing 
released in your life. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God was already planning to crush Satan under our feet, even though we blew it and give away, gave away our authority. It's like we had a set of keys of authority that God gave us. And when Adam and Eve sinned, they gave those keys to Satan. When Jesus died, the Bible says he went down into the depths of the earth. He took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And today, he's holding those keys back out to you and I. And he says this. I'm giving you the keys the second time. Guard them well. They cost me my life. But he's a God of second chances. Prophetically in Genesis chapter 3, it talks about how one day the seed of the woman, which was, would be the Messiah, would come and strike Satan's head. As Jesus talked about in, uh, in John where he says, you know, uh, yeah, you will crush Satan under your feet in demonic forces. Verse 15 says, and I will cause hostility, enmity is what the original word was, between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, speaking, we will strike Satan's head and you will strike his heel. Today, um, as we uh, conclude our message, I want to ask you, do you understand how much God loves you? Do you understand that he doesn't want you just to survive? Although some of us today, those of you that are watching online, you might be feeling, you know, I just, I just, I just need to survive another day. God not only wants you to survive, he wants you to thrive. He's given you a mandate. He's got a plan for your life. And you know what? I, I, I have to say, like, I mean, God wants to bless us on this earth. It's true. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that everybody else is chasing after. He said, These will be added unto you. I've experienced that in my life. I've watched other people, how they've experienced that in their lives. But many of these things are temporary. The things of God that he has for you, the blessings of God that he has for you, um, they're wonderful. But we need to seek first him, his kingdom, his righteousness. If you're here today or you're watching online and you're wondering, does God have a plan for my life? I can tell you that he has a plan for your life, no matter what mistakes that you've made, no matter what kind of a, what you feel is maybe a mess that you find yourself in, the brokenness you have in your life. Maybe you're dealing with mental illness. Many people are struggling with mental illness right now because of the oppressive kind of things that are going on around us. God wants you to rise above that. He wants you to experience his power because when you surrender your life to Christ, what happens is he comes and he lives right inside of you by his spirit. He speaks to you. Can I encourage you? Read his word every day. Because when you read his word, the Bible actually says this, the Holy Spirit watches over his word to perform it. He wants to perform his word in your life. And today, if you're either in this room or you're watching online and you say, you know what, I, <laughs> I don't even really understand a lot of what you're saying. All I know is that right now I feel like I'm broken. I feel lost. And I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to be in that relationship that I was created to have with God by asking him into my life, forgive me of my sins, to be my Lord and to be my Savior. And the Bible gives a very clear picture of the Father, that his arms are wide open, embracing us when we come to him and we humble ourselves. He wants to embrace us. He's not standing there with his arms crossed. You know, all of our earthly fathers, mothers, they did the best and they're doing the best that they can. But often they don't necessarily represent God's unconditional love for us, even when we've blown it. I know I haven't as a dad, but God wants to reveal that to you. If that's your desire today that you'd like to pray, you'd like to invite Christ into your life, and when you do that, his Holy Spirit will come and live inside of you. And you want to be born again so that as your spirit becomes alive to God, when you leave this earth, you will go to be with him. I'd like you 
to take the opportunity to pray this prayer with me. You can say it out loud because he wasn't ashamed of you when he hung on that cross as the Son of God, totally humbled, probably stripped naked actually, but totally humbled. He did that because he loves you. Will you pray this with me, asking Christ into your life? If that's your desire, it's a choice. God's given us a choice. If you're choosing Jesus today, will you pray this with me? Let's all say it together to encourage those that might be rededicating their lives or giving their lives to Christ for the first time. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, let's say that again. Lord Jesus, I come to you today, and I know that I've sinned. I need your help, Lord. I ask you to come into my life to forgive me of my sin. I want to turn my back on all those things that displease you. From this day forward, I want to live my life by your Spirit. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I believe You died on the cross and took my place so I could be forgiven. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to pray for you now. Lord, for each person that has prayed this prayer, and it's their desire today as they've prayed that to invite you into their life. God, you're waiting with open arms. I pray right now you would fill them with your spirit. Help them to feel that adoption that your word talks about. Help them to feel they're that adopted son, that adopted daughter, like the prodigal son who was lost in sin and darkness. You were there embracing him in his filthiness, but because he repented, you embraced him and wrapped your arms of love around him. I pray every person that is here in this place or that is watching this online will feel those father's arms wrapping around them that embrace of love and unconditional acceptance right where they're at today. God, touch each heart, encourage each heart today. In Jesus' name, with heads bowed and eyes closed. And of course, if you're watching this online, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it and you said, today I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I know and I believe that he died for me and he has a purpose for my life with heads bowed and eyes closed across this room. You're online watching this, and you gave your life to Christ. I want you to raise your hand to the Lord. He's the one that sees. He's the one you're responding to. He's the one that you're giving your yes to. Just right now, take the opportunity. Raise your hand. Say, God, I prayed that today, and I meant that. God sees your hand. God sees your hand. He loves you so much. One last moment. Anybody that wants to raise their hand, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for each one that's responding to your word today. Thank you for the truth of the gospel. Thank you, Lord, that you've always had a plan for people. And today, as we give you, each one of us, can we stand together? Lord, as each one of us give you our yes, if that's your desire, why don't you just lift your hands to the Lord? Lord, as each one of us are giving you our yes, Lord, we want to fulfill and walk out the plans and the purposes that you have for us because you love us so much. Holy Spirit, come and fill and live through each one of us today. Lord, we give you our yes. We give you our lives because we know as we surrender our lives to you, just like your word says, you will add all these things that everybody else is chasing after. You're going to add them unto us, Lord, because you love us. You're a loving father. You have good things for us. You'd never hold anything back from us that's good. Every good gift, every perfect gift comes from you, and I pray that will be released in each heart and each life here today. Can you just take a moment? As we're closing our service, just between you and the Lord, just kind of out loud, sort of to yourself, though. Just tell the Lord you love him. Maybe that sounds strange to you. Just tell him that. Jesus, I love you. I love you, Lord. I'm just so content to be your son, to be your daughter. Bless each family that's represented here. I just say the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his unfailing peace. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming uh, to church today. Thank you so much for watching online. If you gave your heart to the Lord today, I'm going to ask you to only, there's only one thing I'm going to ask you to do, and that is to tell someone. If you're watching online and there isn't someone there that you can tell, or even if there is, we'd love to hear from you via email. Some of you are sending us emails about what God's doing in your life. We're seeing so many answers to prayer. If you have a prayer request and you want to send that in via email, please feel free to do that too. We'd uh, love to pray for you. God bless you. Have a Jesus-filled week. Did you enjoy the Word of God today? Have a Jesus-filled week. Have a Holy Spirit-filled week. Um, uh, Let's go and tell somebody about God's love today. Go tell somebody about God's love today because people need hope, and that hope lives inside of you. God bless you. Amen.